grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. According to the old Adam in us, authority can be something of a dirty word in our lives. We don't like it. We rebel against it. We want to be the ones in charge. Of course, sometimes authority can be abusive or oppressive, but there are good authorities as well, ones who use their authority for the benefit of others instead of themselves. God is a God of order, and God is a God of design, and in his order and design, he planned authority to be placed over us for our good. Good parents, good leaders, good bosses, good government, good church leaders, ones who develop trust in the people for whom they are responsible. Good authority is a good gift from a good God. And Jesus exercised good authority. Like other good authority figures, Jesus didn't seek authority for himself. He says so himself. It was given to him. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In his state of humiliation, Jesus submitted himself to the will of his heavenly Father, using his Father's authority for the ultimate good of all, namely the salvation of all humankind. And so in today's gospel, Jesus displays both his authority and his active work toward that salvation by his teaching and by his power over demons. Well, what was so special about this teaching of Jesus? He taught as one who had authority, not like the teaching they'd been hearing from the scribes who were so quick to cite highfalutin rabbinic names in an attempt to somehow give their words credence. But in fact, these empty shells weren't interested in creeds at all. They were obsessed with deeds. They were only interested in the endless duties of the law. And from the general law of the Torah, they extracted rules and regulations for almost any and every situation. Generation after generation passed down this oral law which then was committed to memory. And since these guys were the experts of this unwritten code, they were also the champions as the ones who passed judgment on individual cases. And so while the scribes are busy exacting and deducing, being quick to quote, Jesus was cutting to the quick boldly preaching crazy things like contrition and repentance and faith, the full counsel of God. Jesus laid it on the line, and he told them just how it is, on no less authority than that of God himself. And that kind of helps us understand what a startling contrast this teaching of Jesus was. The difference was so great that our text says that people, the NIV says, were amazed. The ESV says, were astonished. The Greek literally says they were dumbfounded. (laughs) They didn't even know what to say. They were dumbfounded by this teaching. And I want to add that this astonishment, this dumbfoundedness, refers first and foremost to to the content of Jesus' teaching. He wasn't preaching about endless circumstances of choosing the right behavior. He was preaching about unpopular things like sin and grace. His message wasn't, what should I do, but rather, what has God done because of what I have or haven't done? This wasn't some new teaching that was now all the rage in Capernaum. 
This was a dusting off, if you will, and a presentation of the timeless truths of God's Word. It was a teaching that man by nature was utterly incapable of keeping God's law. It was a teaching that through the coming and the work of the Messiah, forgiveness would be won for sinful, helpless mankind. It was a teaching that Christianity would be not so much about the Christian, but about Christ and what he has done. For the Christian. The content of Jesus' teaching, but it wasn't just the content, it was also the manner in which he taught. There was no gap between the message and the messenger. When I kneel and pray before I step into the pulpit, one of the prayers I often pray almost every time is, Lord, speak through me in spite of me. Because unfortunately, with all our quirky mannerisms and personality quirks in life, sometimes there can be that gap between message and messenger. It wasn't that way with Jesus. When Jesus taught, he was presenting simultaneously the person and the work of the Messiah in the flesh, no less. And this Son of God directly taught the message and the intent of the Eternal Father. But you know as well as I do that this message of good news isn't always received with joy and amazement and astonishment. Sometimes people don't like what the prophet has to say. The law hurts, but the law has to hurt so that the gospel can heal. And what we often find in our culture of me doing what I want when I want is a rejection of the good. Long ago, there was one who had everything, but everything just didn't seem to be enough, and so he rebelled against the one who had given him everything. And he put together an army, an evil army, so that a proper war could be fought. He enlisted wicked assistance from the four corners, north, south, east, and west. His assistant from the west was particularly fiendish and carried out the evil one's intentions with great aggression. The wicked one barged right into the midst of goodness and demanded confrontation. But the good one, named Glinda, wouldn't allow such a thing. She stopped the wicked one right in her tracks. And I mean that quite literally, as she warned that wicked one that a house might fall on her too. And so out went the wicked one. She had no choice but to buckle under the greater authority. But she didn't go quietly. On her way out, she boldly predicted that she would be the victor in the end. Victor over Dorothy, Dog, and all. What rashness, what audacity. How often the evil one just barges right in and he acts like he owns the place. Look at our text. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Notice his word. What do you want with us? It's like saying, what are you doing here? You see, the demon was obviously used to having the place to himself. And in comes Jesus, 
and he recognizes the threat, and he says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus wouldn't take any more. Even though what the demon said was true, it certainly was no endorsement. It was kind of like having Adolf Hitler as your character witness. So Jesus shuts him up. Literally, the Greek word is muzzles him. You ever seen a dog with a muzzle on? That's the picture here. Muzzles him. Jesus says three little words, and that's all it took to vanquish the wicked one. No magic, no big show, no incantation, no hocus pocus, just three little Greek words. Phimotheti kai exeltha. Be silent, come out. Be gone. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed. They asked each other, what is this? A new teaching? And with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. You see, this is what threatens the devil and his evil angels most. To be utterly put in their place, to be reminded that they never had and they never will have the ultimate authority, that they never can be God. Jesus Christ, whom neither the cross nor the tomb could hold forever, is God. The only God-man in the flesh. As Martin Luther wrote, God's powerful and efficacious word acts as a fumigant. It makes the flea, F-L-E-A, flee, F-L-E-E. It makes that F-L-E-A our constant nemesis and pest flee. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. For where God's word is applied, Satan cannot stand. And I want to remind you of this. This is so important Pick up the sword of the Spirit and do battle with the evil one because Jesus has vanquished the evil one for you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Pick up the Word of God. Where the Word of God is applied, Satan cannot stand. So, three little words from the mouth of God did fell him. And that's all it takes for us too. Three little words from the mouth of God. God's word has the final authority. But in our case, they're words with authority to restore. Because these words are, you are forgiven. Three little words. In Christ, You are forgiven. Because of the cross, you are forgiven. Because of the empty tomb, you are forgiven. Three little words from the mouth of God, dispelling all the gloom and sadness and filling your life with joy and gladness, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.